I'm, I'm, here, I'm here to be the wet blanket, uh, to be the, the skeptic. Um, and I'm in a funny position here because obviously I'm not a technologist um, and people who are, uh, are you know, wildly impressed. They think that the, uh, both the algorithms underlying uh, uh, cryptocurrency and the system that uh, the founder of, crypto, of Bitcoin, whoever he was, um, created are extremely ingenious. They're a remarkable answer to something. Uh, I used, when I was a, a, a kid, I, I had a math teacher who, if you gave a wrong answer, would say, save that answer, I might ask that question someday. Uh, and the question, really, what we'll come back to, and I will come back to, is, is really, what problem does cryptocurrency solve? Um, before I get there, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, let, let's talk about money, which is the monetary economics is something I think I do understand, or at least have, have put in a fair bit of time on, um, including the history, and I think the history is a, is a relevant starting point here. Um, so money, first thing to say about money is remember always that money is only incidentally an asset. It's not something that produces in and of itself. Money is a lubricant. Money is something you use to facilitate transactions in the, in the real economy. Um, and what you want is for that lubricant to be as invisible, as frictionless as possible. Um, and the history of money has been one of making uh, money increasingly invisible, increasingly frictionless. Uh, has been one of pushing it into the background. So in the beginning, there, were metallic, there was metallic money, gold and silver coins, um, which had some important virtue. First of all, they were a whole lot better than barter, a lot easier to hand over a few gold coins than to say, uh, I'll give you a cow in return for two sheep. Um, but, uh, uh, and they were, they were relatively easy to verify. Uh, you could bite them to make sure they really were gold. You could weigh them to make sure they had as much gold as they were supposed to. Um, they were also cumbersome. Uh, they were a little bit difficult. You have to carry around clanking bags of stuff. Uh, there was high risk of theft. Uh, of theft of, uh, so making transactions with metallic coins was always a little bit difficult. And in fact, quite early on, uh, uh, people resorted to indirect ways of, of of making transactions, particularly at long distances. So if you ask, what was a bank uh, in the 17th century? Uh, what was a bank in the year 1700? It wasn't actually mostly a place that you know, lent money or anything like that. It was actually mostly about uh, transactions. If I was a, a merchant uh, in Italy and I wanted to make transactions in Belgium, uh, I would get a letter sent from my banker in Florence to uh, to the banker in Bruges, and uh, um, I would hand coins over in one place, and, and my agent would be able to collect coins at the other end, bills of exchange. Um, that was a system that worked, but it was still cumbersome. Then came paper money. Uh, instead of carrying around bags of gold coins, you carried around uh, uh, printed pieces of paper that were a promise to pay gold coins on demand from a private bank. Uh, which was a huge advance, both, actually it was a huge advance in two ways. It, it was a lot easier to carry around and make your transactions, and it also meant that fewer resources had to be expended in digging up uh, and smelting gold and silver. So you, you, re you reduced the real resources. Um, then we evolved into uh, pure fiat money, where there, are, there is no gold or silver behind uh, the notes. They're simply the, the statement of the government that this is legal tender. Uh, and what, what enforces that, I mean, a, a bank in, in the old system had to have sufficient gold and silver uh, in reserve that it could pay on demand. Uh, what keeps uh, most currencies uh, valuable is the belief that, well, two things, the belief that governments will exercise restraint in issuing currency. Uh, and the fact that legally you can pay taxes. So if you like, the thing, whole thing is backstopped by, uh, by the fact that you can satisfy men with guns who demand payment by giving them these pieces of paper. Um, and then we moved on from paper currency 
uh, to increasing the use of means of payment that uh, did not actually require even the paper currency. So payment by check, obviously, payment by credit and debit cards, now payment by mobile phone. Um, at each stage of this evolution, we've moved towards a system where the cost of uh, making transactions is lower and the resources used in producing the medium of exchange get ever lower. We use less and less. We don't mine go for gold for monetary purposes anymore. We don't have to uh, spend a lot of time um, uh, you know, hiring guards for the coaches that are carrying bags of gold and silver from one place to another. Um, the direction of that evolution, if you're asking where, where would that lead you to think we were going, it would be towards a cashless society. It would be towards one where uh, money was really just an accounting entry someplace and in which payments were made, uh, well, for, for now, maybe by waving your, your phone, you know, Venmo, by waving your phone at something, maybe at some point the, the chip in your brain will, will just do it. But anyway, the, uh, um, and that is the, you know, that up until not too long ago would have been the way that you thought that money was evolving. Now comes cryptocurrency. Things about, well, let's, let's just talk about Bitcoin as it is, and then we can ask the question, can, can the problems be resolved? The striking thing about Bitcoin is that it sets up a system in which, uh, first of all, uh, the creation of this currency involves a lot of real resources. We're actually spending a lot of resources now computing power or electricity to generate this, much as we used to spend a lot of resources digging up gold to create gold currency. Um, and it is, in fact, expensive to make transactions. It's uh, the, 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 uh, the actual implementation of the blockchain is, uh, uh, is one that is hard. It's hard to do transactions in Bitcoin. Uh, now, come back to whether that can be resolved. But, you know, from the point of view of people who do technology, this is a impressive thing. This is a step into the future. From the point of view of monetary economists, we're exploiting cutting edge uh, computer science um, to set the clock back 300 years. So why exactly are we doing this? What, why would we be recreating all the disadvantages of metallic money in, in digital form? Why would we want to do this? What is the problem that we are solving? Uh, and don't say, well, digital is good because there's lots of forms of digital payment out there. We could be moving that way. I mean, we, we could, um, we may uh, uh, quite soon have entire national economies that are completely digital money. Sweden is, is contemplating the abolition of cash. Um, and it's, I, you know, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I do walk around with a little bit of cash in my wallet, but really, it's, it's no longer much of a constraint. Um, so it's not about the digitality of it. Um, it's about, well, maybe we, don't, maybe we don't trust governments, and so inevitably hyperinflation comes up. And yes, hyperinflations do happen. Um, they haven't happened a lot. Um, by the way, the, the traditional uh, definition of a hyperinflation from the, by, economists love hyperinflation because we understand them really well, and so we love to dwell on them. And it's become a little bit hard to teach that particular class in your principles course because the hyperinflations are getting rarer and rarer. We're having fewer and fewer examples. So, you know, Zimbabwe actually is, is on a dollar standard now. They, they, that, that's, that's in the past. Um, the traditional definition is 50% inflation a month. Uh, let's be looser. Let's say, let's talk about 50% inflation per year. So let me give you a comprehensive list of the countries that currently have inflation exceeding 50% a year. South Sudan and Venezuela. End of story. There are no other traditional. There are not. If I if I drop that criterion to 30% a year, then I get a wider set of countries. But it's you know mostly governments don't abuse uh, the printing press heavily. Um, partly because well, let's let's talk about how our system actually works. What makes the monetary system work? How do I know that uh, that that the money my bank says I have will in fact be honored? What what allows this whole system to work? Um, there's nothing really, you know, there, there's certainly nothing like a blockchain in most of what we do. Uh, what we have is middlemen, institutions, 
And those institutions honor the promises they make to us, well, partly because the government tells them to, um, but the government in turn has its own reasons. And what it really is, it's about reputation. You have enduring institutions which want to honor the commitments they've made because they have a reputation to preserve. They want to preserve um, a, a position, a market position into the future. One way to think about that is reputation is a technology. It's, it's, we, we solve a lot of problems in the economy by turning what could be one-shot gains in which people literally take the money and run and turning them into repeated gains in which people have an incentive to behave well this period so that you will trust them next period and so on into the future. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, it's not just money. We couldn't run our economy at all if it was all one-shot games. Uh, it, it has to, repeated games are what everything we do practically in a modern economy, actually in almost any economy short of, uh, of um, I was about to say people, hunter-gatherers, but hunter-gatherers, you know, a group of 30 hunter-gatherers are engaged in repeated games with each other too. That's what keeps it going. Uh, so the interesting thing about all of this shift to cryptocurrency is it's saying, let's throw away this technology, it's, more, it's a social technology rather than, a, than a, you know, a, a mathematical technology, but let's throw away the social technology of repeated games and reputation and try and build a system that is going to operate purely on the basis of an algorithm that, that assures us that we have what we need, uh, that, that this is a real Bitcoin. So we're basically saying uh, we're going to abandon the whole process of having banks and governments uh, produce currency you can trust, uh, and instead we're going to produce a digital equivalent of being able to bite a gold coin to make sure that it's really gold. Well, uh, it's, it's amazing that they can do that. That's really impressive. But again, what is the problem that we're solving? Why are we doing this? Now, um, the trouble, the, anything, any system that's built on reputation um, runs the problem of potential defectors of people who just say, oh, the hell with it, I'm just gonna, gonna grab and leave. And that's going to be a problem. Um, it has historically been the problem with, uh, occasionally, governments engage in hyperinflation. Although, if you look at when it happens, uh, it's, hyperinflation never happens just because governments are untrustworthy. It's always associated with political and social collapse. If you wanna ask what the, what's going wrong in Venezuela, you know, in many ways, the hyperinflation is the least of it. It's a, it's a much broader, much bigger issue, and uh, cryptocurrency is not going to put food in the stores when there's no food in the stores, right? It's, it's not, it's, it's a, it's not fund Venezuela's problem is not fundamentally a monetary problem, and most really severe monetary problems are not. Most really severe monetary problems are really political problems, and nothing you can do technologically is going to, is going to offer a resolution. Um, there is... Um, Costs. Um, it is true that in some circumstances there seem to be rather high costs associated with middlemen. Um, it's, I think, quite interesting to ask why this is the case. Why does it cost so much to send remittances? And I doubt that that's inherent in the technology of conventional banking. In fact, I know it's not inherent in the technology of conventional banking. Uh, I suspect it has to do with a combination of market power, but also largely, you know, government enforced barriers, particularly government barriers that reinforce that market power. Um, my parallel is think about <laughs> roaming charges on your cell phone, right? Why is it that you can travel um, thousands of miles uh, and face no roaming charges and then you cross a particular border and all of a sudden data becomes very expensive. Uh, there's nothing about the technology. There's no harder to, uh, to, 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 uh, to connect me in another country. It's because, well, governments have intervened in bad ways and have, have allowed local monopolists to exploit their position. Um, Bitcoin, something like that, might offer a way around that, maybe being used a little bit. Uh, I have, I would, maybe Catherine and I can talk about this later, I'm very curious about how people who are unbanked and presumably they're, along with that, are presumably not on the internet, are able to use Bitcoin. 
I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not at all clear how that's supposed to be working, and I wonder if there aren't some middlemen we're not hearing about in the background that are actually making that function. Uh, but the, the, the question really is, is this inherent? Is this a technological problem, or are we talking about other kinds of problems which, you know, if you do find a technological solution, that solution is probably an end run around whatever the regulations are that are causing this thing to be a problem. Uh, and by the way, if you do an end run around government regulations, one of two things can happen. The government can fix the regulations or they can find a way to crack down on you. Uh, and if Bitcoin became really a, a serious, well, okay, it, uh, you'd be amazed at how quickly uh, whatever freedom you think you're getting via the blockchain would disappear. Actually, that was, that was one of the more interesting parts of Catherine's presentation. Um, the, um, um, now, do the costs have to be, the, meanwhile, the costs of actually using cryptocurrency are quite high. Both the cost of transaction and the costs of simply creating new units of currency. So the resource use is a, is a big issue. Are those problems that are going to be solved through better technology? Is that something that is going to be, that cl God knows, there are clever people in Silicon Valley. Um, they will try to work on solutions. Can they actually solve this problem? Um, if I come up with, the, the reason that it's so expensive to produce a Bitcoin now is that the thing was designed so that each successive one gets harder to do. So if I somehow found a way to cut the current cost of doing those computations by a factor of 10, what would happen is people would generate a bunch more Bitcoins and we quickly push that much closer to the limit and the cost would be right back where it is now. All it would do is get you a few more Bitcoins. It's kind of a, almost like a Malthusian, you know, population expands to drive people down to the edge of starvation. Uh, Bitcoin uh, circulation will always expand to drive the, the cost of producing a Bitcoin up to the point of being insane. Um, transactions is another issue, and here's where I get really, uh, I feel a little bit less secure. But if you're going to have a system where you are producing, providing incentives, for people to validate the currency, that means you have to somehow, what, you know, one person's incentives are another person's costs. So how are you gonna have a system that has the incentive, that pr continues to provide incentives for validation that doesn't actually impose substantial costs on the users of the currency? And I, I, without being a technology expert, I just, just on general principles, I find it hard to understand how that works. If people, now, one thing that could happen is that people introduce alternative cryptocurrencies, but of course if they do that, then we have a much larger supply of cryptocurrency and the price, the value of the existing cryptocurrencies plunges. So yeah, I can imagine a world in which there are, you know, a uh, um, hundred cryptocurrencies with no dominant role for any one of them, but why would any one of them have any significant value if you did that? And that's not again about the technology, it's about the logic. Um, now what is true, is that Bitcoin and maybe one or two others um, have a kind of first mover advantage which causes them to be what people think of. And they might, uh, I mean, it's the, the point that, that people do sometimes assign value to stuff that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of use um, is, is a good one. Um, you know, I talked about, uh, so for, first of all, here's the example of gold. And gold, yeah. Uh, now, gold is not money. Not in any of the real senses. Nobody, you know, go into a, go into a store and try and pay your bill with, uh, with, with a bar of gold. It ain't gonna work. Uh, uh, gold is not, in fact, a medium of exchange. It's not something you can, in fact, use for, um, for transactions. Uh, it's not even all that easily converted into other mediums of exchange. Um, but gold is a something, it's an asset that people hold and they, it's just a lot of value out there, and, and it's, it's kind of sort of time-honored. Um, gold isn't the only example of something like that. Um, when I said we, we tend to move towards a more abstract, frictionless economy where we use less and less actual cash, there's a funny thing if you actually look at the numbers. Um, if you look at the United States, the, uh, the ratio of currency in circulation to GDP fell steadily as far back as we can tell, up until about 1980. And then it started rising again. And we actually have substantially more 
uh, dollar cash in circulation relative to GDP than we did in 1980. Funny thing about that, however, is that all, actually more than all of the rise in cash holdings is 50 and primarily $100 bills. So it's all high denomination notes, and, um, which are also effectively not money. You really, uh, there are very few stores that will accept a $100 bill for, for a sandwich. Um, um, who's holding those things? Well, uh, indirect estimates suggest that something like two-thirds of those high denomination dollar notes are held outside the United States. Uh, they're being held as, as hordes of value, and they're being held as hordes of value even though you can't actually do business with them. Uh, but, and here's where I get, have my, so, all right, so one, it, it, the, best, the best argument I could possibly be persuaded uh, for on, on the question of Bitcoin is that Bitcoin will become like gold or high denomination notes. It'll be something that people hold in their, in their stashes in, in, uh, uh, in Buenos Aires or, uh, or actually high denomination Euro notes in, in, uh, in, uh, in the former Soviet Union. Uh, people just hang on to them. The trouble I have, and I'm not sure, I, I have people who share most of what I say but, but think that there, a lot of value will, will be retained is, can it just sit there as a self-fulfilling prophecy? This stuff is valuable and therefore it's valuable. Um, what I would say, however, is that both gold and $100 bills have a, now, <laughs> first time I said this, I said they, they're, they are tethered to reality. And then it turned out that that was a bad word to use when talking about to crypto people. So, uh, so they're, uh, uh, never mind tether, um, they're backstopped by, in fact, having some real world use. Um, in the case of gold, it's teeth, but also actually jewelry. You know, I, there, an awful lot, and remember, there is a limited supply of gold in the world, and gold lasts forever, and gradually it disappears into teeth and jewelry, which, never are, which are lost. So uh, you can make a, a kind of long-run argument that says that even though the current demand for gold fillings is not that big, it's not that crazy for gold to be worth that much. Um, and $100 bills, one thing you can definitely do with $100 bills is you can, you can turn them back into $20 bills, which are money. And so they are so definitely backstopped by conversion into something of, of genuine use. And the trouble with cryptocurrencies is they have nothing. What is the fundamental value? What is, what is the thing that you can definitely do that you know that five years from now, 10 years from now, you can do with a, with a Bitcoin? And there isn't anything. A Bitcoin is valuable only insofar as people continue to think it's valuable. If, you know, if, if tomorrow morning everybody woke up and said, dollar bills are worthless, that wouldn't last very long because uh, later that same day, uh, the tax authority will tell you, uh, here's what you owe and it must be paid in dollars and we will accept the dollars. Um, if tomorrow morning, I, I, I should tell you this by the way, I, um, my, my wife knew I was coming to this but she didn't know when I was speaking and she looked at the Bitcoin price this morning and emailed me to say, what did you say? Uh, <laughs> uh, um, the, uh, uh, if people decide that Bitcoin is worthless, it's worthless, just like that, because there is no backstop. There is nothing to tie it down. Now, I'm not 100% sure of that, but maybe. Uh, uh, but, but I think that there's a, certainly a, I would say a quite significant probability that the whole thing just drops to zero. Uh, because I have not yet seen any reason why this has to be a valuable thing. Uh, broader applications of the blockchain, and I think I'm going to probably want to stop there because I think we're well behind. Um, I'm relatively agnostic, um, although again, I have to say the blockchain is a substitute and so far a relatively expensive substitute for a technology that we've spent centuries developing, the technology of trust based upon repeated transactions. So why exactly would we be wanting to do that? And so I, I, this is my second um, Bitcoin related event in the last few weeks. The previous one someone was giving as an example of great stuff that blockchain could do. Well, it means that you could conceivably, if you're getting a prescription at the drugstore, you can check and be sure that that really is the medicine they say it is. Uh, gosh, you know, there are a lot of things I worry about when getting medication. Um, 
mostly whether my doctor is, is at all prescribing the right thing, uh, whether it's actually, uh, you know, uh, naproxen is really pretty low on my list of, of, of things. Um, so that I, I, I'm waiting to hear the really persuasive examples, but I'm, I'm more open-minded on that. The one thing I will say is so far cryptocurrency shows no sign whatsoever of becoming currency. Whatever it's doing, it's not money. And if you step back from the, the romance of the technology, it looks like a giant step back into the monetary past, which is not something I think we really ought to be doing. Thank you. <laughs>